Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Boots and Backstraps podcast. Brought to you by Homes by Shane and produced by Danny Geo Productions. Come on now. Honey's on looking for backstraps way deep in the woods. Tracking in a swamp to a hay field under the harvest moon. When the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. Head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and backstraps. Hey everybody, this is a show where we talk all things hunting and country music. From the classics through today. From big bucks to bull elk. We've got it all. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Boots and Backstraps. We got the camera right on our guest to start with today. <laughs> there it is. There's the two shot. <laughs> I'm your host, Shane Michael. I'm joined, as always, by the celebrity uh, himself, the world famous, <laughs> the legendary, the infamous Tom Cat. Oh, come on, come on, come on now. Come on now. <laughs> How we doing, sir? Sound like Tom DeRay. <laughs> he likes to do that stuff. I'm doing great. I'm really excited about our show today. I am, too. It seems like it's been forever since we filmed. Yeah, but it hasn't. <laughs> it's been two days. <laughs> two days ago, we did a live thing at uh, the Hog's Breath. I hope all of you had a... An opportunity to view that one or hear it. We had uh, a guy who was really a legend, Tom DeRay, the owner of the Hog's Breath. Been there for about 47 years. It was incredible to me to hear the stories of the like beginnings of the Hog's Breath and how right. you two met and the, like all the different things, the phases that Hog's Breath went through to get to where it is now. You'd never know walking in there now that it was like a discotheque to start with <laughs> yeah well you know it, actually you know the hog's breath when it first started for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the hog's breath in 1976 clint eastwood opened the very first hog's breath in carmel california and tommy and i and steve and we opened up the second one in the nation and in little canada saint paul and uh that was 1977, and then since, there's been hog's breaths that have opened up all over the world. Uh, my wife and I are going down to Key West in uh, about a month, and we're going to hang out at the hog's breath down there. There's one in Fort Walton Beach. There's one in Texas. There's used to be, I don't know how many of them are still open, but they were in New Zealand, Japan, Australia, England. Uh, they were kind of like a hard rock deal, and uh, <laughs> I, I think what kind of pushed him over the edge was the movie along something about mary okay there was a can't think of the actor's name but uh i should because he's done a million comedy movies ben stiller ben stiller yeah ben stiller thank yeah. you and carmen diaz mm -hmm. yep. and brett Favre had a cameo in that Cam <laughs> cameron diaz oh sorry cameron yeah. diaz what did i say anyway carmen cameron. carmen 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 <laughs> san carmen diego. san diego yeah Oh, boy. Anyway, one of the guys in there were wearing a uh, Hog's Breath T-shirts. And uh, they got a little cameo for a little plug for the Hog's Breath. Anyway, that was a fun uh, live, uh, our first and only uh, live segment that we've done. Yeah, and we're going to do some more, I think. It was, a, it was a really good time, as you mentioned. And there's definitely a clamoring now with our audience to, to do some more of those live remote yeah, that show was fun. episodes. It's a lot of work for our producer, poor Danny, who's in here tonight, getting all this stuff set back up again. So we're a little behind schedule, but luckily our guest is very gracious and patient. And he got here early, and we're starting late. <laughs> <laughs> that first opening uh, shot, Thurman must have been thinking, "Uh oh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's all me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was your show. Sorry yeah. about that. That was me. Well, that I, was before you do an intro for our, our guest, TK, um, I do want to say that we have been getting some calls to switch it up a little because we've talked so much about big game and about hunting real succinctly. And now tonight with uh, our celebrity guest, and he is a celebrity, as I have learned with my homework now, um, yeah, we've had a lot of hunting guests, and uh, for those of you that are listening, uh, one of the reasons we're doing so many is we have a whole long list of uh, celebrities and guests that are coming on, but it, it's not easy getting our five people and then these people on the same page. It is a challenge. like next week you're going on vacation and... You so, can say it now on Mike TK. Oh, You're not yeah. letting the cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I almost let the cat out of the bag 
couple segments ago. I, my wife just graduated with her doctorate a couple weeks ago, and it was uh, five years of you know school awesome. and all that. So sure. she's officially a doctor now. Well, anyway, I had been planning for a year and a half to take her on this trip to Mexico as a graduation present. Sure. And, uh, so TK knew about it. He's, you know, one of my best friends. So I told him and told Lynn and that kind of thing. And, and we were filming an episode a couple of weeks ago and he almost let it out and she didn't know yet because she hadn't graduated yet. I wonder yet. if it was on uh, the segment because you were going, I was like, <laughs> he's like, you're getting ready to go somewhere. And I was like, uh, don't say it. <laughs> but at any rate, folks, uh, it's kind of tough getting everybody on the same page. So it is. for those of you that are waiting, uh, for some more country entertainers to be on the show, have uh, have faith; they'll be on here, and we've got some uh, do. We got some great ones lined up for the future. Well, what I was going to say, TK, is we get to go kind of on a little bit of a rabbit hole tonight because instead of talking about big game and talking about hunting, we get to talk about birds and we get to talk about conservation. Yeah, which is going to be a really nice switch. You know, I was going through my list of contacts and I said, you know, we got to get Thurman Tucker on here. Heck yeah, and we do tonight. So, with that being said, all the way up from uh, originally Memphis, Tennessee. He's become a very good friend of mine. He's a great Christian man, and he's uh, just a salt of the earth, and I have a lot of admiration for him, and I know you do too, Shane. I do. And uh, I've been, I've had the pleasure of hosting uh, some of his banquets, uh, whether it be down in Caledonia, Minnesota, or um, not South St. Paul, but it is St. New- Paul Park, Newport. Yeah. Newport, down in that area. Mm-hmm. Oh, at Tenucci's. Yep. Yeah, a place where they've got excellent food. So I've had the fortune of hosting uh, the banquets there. It's something that I've done a lot over my life, over my lifetime, and we have a lot of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Thurman Thomas. Thurman is- Tucker. <laughs> Oh, how, many, how, how often does that happen to you? <laughs> oh, an awful lot. <laughs> He's in the Hall of Fame, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, he is. So I can't I mean, believe I did that. Yeah. I'm watching too many commercials, watching too much television. Welcome to the show, my this friend. This is Thurman Tucker, okay, who is originally from Memphis. He's up here in Minnesota. For how long have you been in Minnesota, Thurman? Well, I came here in 65, so it's been a few years. Yeah, it's a couple anyway. Oh, yeah. I was negative 12. <laughs> <laughs> Thurman, it's wonderful to have you here. And yeah. Thurman is the uh, president of the Quail Forever chapter here in uh, the one and only chapter in Minnesota. Minnesota is very much on the northern edge of the uh, quail habitat populated areas. Um, and pretty much southern Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll let Thurman uh, tell you how far north he anticipates them coming or they have come. Uh, he has a banquet, as I mentioned. Uh, and unfortunately, with the COVID, last year and this year's banquets have been waylaid. And I know all of the banquets for all of the fundraisers, for all of the nonprofits have been canceled. And so everybody in that industry is hurting Thurman, good to have you here. I think we'll let you talk. My pleasure, my pleasure. Just a couple of things, though. We do have two chapters here in the state. Oh, we do? One in the metro area, one in the southeast. Right. And I'm coordinator of both. I'm the president of the metro chapter and all. And, uh, right, right. And the official state-level coordinator, right? Yeah. Right, and I didn't, in my no limited problem. thinking, <laughs> yeah. I'm no thinking, problem. okay, Thurman's the president of both. So, yes, folks, there are two chapters, the metro chapter and the southern chapter where the mm-hmm. banquets are typically held in the caledonia town the town mm-hmm. of caledonia yeah. great yeah. town i love caledonia the so, reading i was doing thurman was speaking a lot to the population being diminished that kind of thing and what you're doing in your efforts to regrow the population but that they were primarily focused in the southeast part of the state so how much are you seeing in the quail in this bob white quail more specifically in this area? Well, most of the quail sightings we get are from Houston County. We do get a few. Houston County is the very southeastern corner of the state. Yeah. Right uh, just north of Iowa and just uh, west of uh, Wisconsin. But we do get some sightings out of Winona County, which is the next county over, and also Fillmore County. So we get some sprinklings here and there. In fact, last Great. week we got a sighting out of uh, uh, Dorchester, Iowa, which is about six miles south of Houston County. So they're in the area. Right. Okay, great. But not as nearly as much as we'd like to see of them. Yeah, so w- what are we doing in the Twin City area more specifically to support their population growth and preservation? Basically, our metro, actually, Quail Forever, Pheasants Forever, 
almost the same thing. Right. We're a subsidiary of Cousins Forever. And with the chapters, you can do whatever you want to regarding trying to either helping kids, uh, providing scholarships, hunting, fishing, any outdoor activity, so to speak. So the Metro chapter... we Not prim- hunting quail, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so the Metro chapter, we primarily focus on getting youth outdoors. That's our big emphasis here. So we're not so much on the quail part of it, although we do help out something. We do get the kids going down southeast, building habitat for quail here in the Metro area. But... Here is more trying to get the young people outdoors. It's just a big push. You know, we have too many people, I think, my opinion, uh, watching videos and playing oh, games yeah. and that type of stuff. And we <laughs> like to get them out there in the woods and the fields. Here's some of your of kids here, Thurman. Yep, yep, there is some right there. This is a spring grow group here that we, we had here uh, just before, that's 2019. Okay. And we were oh. really gearing up for 2020. Look at their snowshoes. Out. They're ready to I go. Know, I know. They're out there. And these are students and all, you know. So we really, really push the students down there and also up here trying to get youth outdoors. So our emphasis is on getting youth outdoors, helping to build wildlife habitat. Yeah, that's fantastic. Boy, I love that picture. Mm-hmm. All those kids down in God's country. Yep. I don't know, if Shane, if you've ever spent any time down in that area. I haven't, the hills no. and the bluffs down there. Uh, most of the people, I think, in Minnesota don't even know that that country exists. Yeah. And if you were to blindfold them, uh, airdrop them down into uh, the Winona, Caledonia, you know, that area, uh, La Crescent, they wouldn't know they're in Minnesota. It's yeah. like being in the foothills of the mountains and there's all these sure. valleys and ravines. And it is spectacular country. Yeah. And I'm heading down there to kill turkeys on Friday. It's it's funny as I grew up in Chaska, which to anyone that's from the metro area, like, whoa, geez, that's crazy south. <laughs> and that's what, 15, 20 miles south of Eden Prairie. It's not that far. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you get over towards Red Wing and then south of Red Wing, you know, you're in some pretty spectacular country. But yeah. when you get down in there on both sides of the river, um, and it goes all the way down through Iowa. You mentioned Dorchester. And... I mean, all the way down, you've got those hills and bluff countries, and uh, it's just, it's it's what I call God's country. Mm-hmm. Can you give us a, oh, here we go, here's look another look photo. Look at that picture. Who's this gentleman that you're with? Well, that's one of our members in the southeast there, and he comes out and helps us build habitat, so to speak, for wildlife, and that's some itch feathering there, mm-hmm. which is a special leaf that quail really love. We had about 15 people on this particular outing, but they just happened to capture him and me. Uh, and that on this particular particular uh, outing here and everything, you know. So when you get out and just kind of build a habitat, that's our whole focus. Yeah, can you talk us through, like as an example, the trip you're on with the kids? What does that look like when you're building habitat? Basically, what we like to do with the kids, they do two primary things. Okay. They either plant the pollinator seeds or they help to build the brush piles. The brush piles, in this case, like we just saw over here. with. Uh, can you go feather- back to that, Danny, for a second? The edge feathering is... Um, it's when we cut the trees down. Here we go. There's the trees are cut down, and then we get in and, and cut these branches off, and we make little piles here and there. And we develop what we call a covey headquarters. Quail love a location, let's say, about the size of this garage here. Okay. About uh, 1,500 square feet. Okay. That's where they like to spend most of their time. But it has to be brushy, just like you saw there. And so we're trying to fill, build these uh, covey headquarters. There another one right there. And that's on Paul Schutte's place, and he's a great friend of ours down there. He's the president of the Southeast Chapter. Okay. And he has a ton of quail on his property. He has more quail on his Who property. Who was that, Thurman? Paul Schutte. Oh, that's that Paul's, was Paul? Yep, this is his oh, property he's a right great here. Guy, now, great guy, great guy. Yep, yep, yep. So and by the way, Thurman, this is a, a television studio, not a, <laughs> not a garage. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here Sorry we go. About <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> You know he was going to come back at you when you corrected him about the two chapters. He was waiting for his opportunity. (laughs) So the brush obviously gives them some cover and security, I would assume. Yep, yep, yep. And this is what we're looking at here. This is good pollinator stuff here. This is good uh, brood rearing. In other words, when the chicks are hatched, the pheasant, quail, uh, meadowlarks, a lot of ground nesting birds. The pheasant are the female, right? Yep, yep. But anyway, they take the brood out into these little places here, and the quail has so many bugs, and the young chicks really love to eat those bugs. The they got to eat them. Yep. yep. And so this is a pollinator site, and again, this is what the, the kids do for us. They plant these, uh, this type of uh, uh, seed planting here, and this grows up, and it's Get excellent. the vegetation. For, uh, yep. Excellent brood rearing there for a lot of birds. You oh, know, Thurman, uh, I have a question. Sure. And, uh, 
it's not necessarily about quail, but you speaking of pollination, I'm not well versed in the problem of pollinators. Uh, you you spoke about this, I think, at the banquet, right? Right, and uh, I'm I I do know what's going on, but maybe you could explain a little bit better. We're losing pollinators, as yes. in bees and uh, butterflies. butterflies yeah. And could you elaborate a little bit more on that? We are losing them at an alarming rate. You know, the honeybee uh, colonies have really collapsed here in the last 10, 15 years tremendously. Most people, everybody got their own views on it and all, but it's, most people believe it's tied into we are putting too many chemicals on the land. Mm. That's really what's causing that. And that's just a theory, not factual, but that's what a lot of people believe. And so, We're not yes, big fans of Monsanto in here, so. Yeah, <laughs> So that's really hurting a lot of wildlife there. You know, I look at habitat when you're trying to develop it. Uh, I just look at our lifestyle for a farmer. And I'm not trying to get on farmers or anything, but I just look at life itself. Mm-hmm. You always got the trade-offs. Yeah. So you can, for instance, you can plant your corn and beans and whatever out there and everything. You use the chemicals. Yeah, you're going to get a greater yield. But at the same time, the trade-off is that you won't get the weeds and the other you know, vegetation that the wildlife really needs. So mm-hmm. you're going to lose the wildlife. So you're going to get one thing, but you're going to lose some. So almost life is just that way. It's just you got to look at some. Do you really want that? My view is I think wildlife provides so much good quality of life for people to be able to hear those birds, to see those birds, to hunt the birds, and also the mammals too, you know, like deer and the rest of them. So it's just so nice. But, again, I just look at us as a society. We've gone to, well, i got to get the money. But when you get the money, you know, you Gee, guys, you lost some stuff here. And a lot of people, again, I'm not trying to criticize here, but when we think about it, when a farmer gets or a landowner gets that money, what he was getting from his land, he's going to go and there's nothing wrong with watching the Vikings, spend a couple thousand dollars to come over to watch the Vikings or go out to Vegas and blow two or three thousand dollars. But if you look at it and say, well, you know what? I can do better by, let's say, okay, I'll just take some of that money and put it into Habitat, and I won't put as much into entertainment or whatever. Now, to each his own. I understand that. Exactly. But yeah. looking at it, hey, you know, you're losing some stuff here that's very vital, I think, to just a human spirit. You know, just to go out and hear quail or hear pheasant or hear turkeys or see them or whatever, to me, is it's just a quality of life that we should not be losing. You know, that reminds me of Thurman is the wolf people, you know, mm-hmm. The majority of the people that support wolves, and they're a fabulous animal, but they yeah. should be controlled by the local governments mm-hmm. and, uh, and in doing so ensure their existence. But they want to hear them wolves howl, but I'm telling you 90-some percent of the wolf supporters never in their lifetime, unless they go up to the wolf center, sure. will ever hear a wolf. Yeah, right. And they're very adamant and strong. I really wish that same mentality would carry over into a conservation and, you know, we can't fault the people in the cities. You're right. They're playing video games. They're probably 90% of them aren't even aware that we need bees, yeah. that we need butterflies, mm-hmm. and we need those pollinators to pollinate our food. Otherwise, we're not going to have any food, and they're this all disappearing. True. And it's, I'm telling you, it's headline news to any of them that are maybe even listening to this program. I don't know why it's not on the media more. Um it's a serious, serious thing. If we lose those bees and those butterflies, well, good luck on uh, raising. And maybe because of that, may, and I don't know the science behind what I'm going to say, maybe if we lose all, then they're going to have to use more chemicals um, mm-hmm. to get our food uh, growing. But You know what's crazy is um, we were talking about the chemicals in particular, and they don't do all that in Europe. You get cleaner food in Europe, you know, like gluten, as an example, is a hot topic in my house because of how wheat is grown in the U.S. Mm-hmm. They grow this sort of hybrid Frankenstein, and they call it dwarf wheat, <laughs> yeah. where it grows faster but a shorter stock, and it grows at twice the yield. But the problem is it's making everybody sick. It's causing all these autoimmune diseases and all these other neurological issues and just, just all this craziness from the wheat that people are eating. But oh. you go cr- across the pond, as they say, mm-hmm. and they don't have that. You can eat all the wheat you want because they're not spraying everything with mm-hmm. chemicals. And so I just I wanted to say two things, um, Thurman, the first of which is um, there's an entire industry dedicated to just observation of birds sure. and their natural habitat. And I think that's fantastic. And the, and the second thing is what you're doing is so important with the kids especially. 
taking these kids out and getting them outside, leave, having them leave their cell phones and their tablets and their video games at home and teaching them about rebuilding the habitat and letting them see firsthand what these animals need, right? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're so right there. And the thing is, too, again, keeping in mind that the trade-off is always there. Mm-hmm. Like I say, you can get the tremendous yields, but on the other hand, at a cost. It yeah. Costs is, I think we have to look at that and say, is it worth it? You know? And, you know, again, I'm not trying to get on our society as such, but you look at it, how many storage facilities we have in this country now in the last 15 years. Yeah. That means to me is that we've got so many things in our house, houses, stuff, that we can't even store it in our houses. Yes. Oh, we're going to buy more. <laughs> And then we're going to put it in a storage facility, you know. It's just, and we've made the storage facilities a multi-billion dollar yep. operation. It's yep. just crazy. I know. But it's just we keep doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. But do we really need all of this? You no. Know? And it's no. just if we cut back, the so guys, life could be a lot better. And I think a lot better if we could cut back, spend more family time, time outdoors, time, you know, communicating with other people and things like that. But it, we just got to have all these gadgets and all these things, and it's just pushing us. Sure, it's good for retailing. But yeah. again, the flip side, the trade-off, eh, man, it's it's hurting us. Thurman, there's a lot of people that think the way you think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Shane and I both agree with everything that you're saying. Unfortunately, there's a lot of the, what we're saying mm-hmm. is falling on a lot of deaf ears. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and that can be said about so many – things in our society oh yeah uh, things that you and i had talked about before we came on camera um what would you run for president please <laughs> no way. i'm gonna vote for you and i'd I'll vote be, for him i'll, yeah, I'll for be sure. your campaign manager <laughs> that is i'll no, tell you what no. regardless of what your political affiliation is that is quite a demanding job yeah, oh, yeah. i mean it's an around <laughs> the clock deal yeah the only guys i'm thinking that are crazy enough to run for president anymore just people with huge egos oh yeah yeah, yeah. and you guys, have to. <laughs> i mean guys like charlton heston yeah before he died yeah. ron reagan was trying to get him to run for president and he would he is the most articulate man i've yeah. ever listened to great conservationist the nra president guy. of the mm-hmm. nra yeah. Yeah. and do you know he's president of the nra and he was a democrat I did not I know was. that. That was interesting. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you should uh, do a little research sure. on uh, Charles uh, Heston. Charlton Heston because he was an amazing. Other than his man. acting career, <laughs> yeah. but he was so. You wouldn't maybe know it, but he's a humble man, mm-hmm. and he wouldn't run for president. He didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah, he would have been probably one of our greatest presidents, but uh, he he's no, and the people that uh, uh, who was the black man, uh, the physician. That was running Ben against. Carson. Yeah, ben, ben Carson. Carson Dr. Sure. Ben Carson. Oh. Neurosurgeon. Yeah. Oh, the smartest man. people on the planet. I know. I would have if he would have been our I would have voted for him in a heartbeat. Right. But these and, and he comes off as a very humble person. Yeah. But he comes off as a man that really cares mm-hmm. and that really wants to a medical mm-hmm. professional, you sure. know. Uh, saving lives all the time. Sure. Yeah, you have to have a super ego, I think, to go for that Absolutely. position. That sounds I mean. scary. How did we get on that topic? Which, I don't know. <laughs> which is, which is probably a, why he didn't win, because yeah. he doesn't have a big enough right. ego. Right. You know? Exactly. I have a question. So sure. being, you know, um, a conservationist, which most hunters are, right? Yep. Yep. Um Do yeah. you hunt for the, for the pheasants and quail? quail? Or are you just there to keep them... No, I hunt them both, and I just don't. It's like we were talking, and I think you were the person I was talking to before. You know, you got so many things you're doing in life, you just have to kind of narrow it down, say, these are the three, four, or five I'm going to do. I just don't have time to hunt like I used to, but I tremendously love it and everything. And just to go out in the field, you know, see the dogs, you know, you just don't get anything. But, boy, the thrill is so great there. And then when you flush a covey, a quail, man, to me it's, the best way I can explain it, when you flush a covey of quail, it sounds like about 90 motorcycles taken off at one time. What does that mean? <laughs> they blow your ears off, oh, man. And you, by the time you get your composure, they got a gun range. You know, the <laughs> pheasants, same thing, too. Or the grouse. I love them all and everything, you know. So I hunt those those birds. But it's not as much as I used to. It's just I don't have the time. But I love it tremendously. In fact, and- I've hunted so much that I get a headache because I get so excited. <laughs> I mean, that's really how, I, you know, it's just, oh, man, I love it. Yeah, you. Before we came on camera, we were talking about the hunt, mm-hmm. and whether it was out in the prairies hunting pheasants and sharp tails, or it's up in the north woods of Wisconsin and Minnesota, yeah. 
in the big timber uh, hunting deer or up in the mountains mm -hmm. hunting elk, yeah. moose, you know, whatever the quarry is, birds, uh, quail, you know, there's so many aspects of it yeah. that is so cool. And if you're with a good buddy and you're having a good time and you're seeing this spectacular country, you're hearing the quail take off, you're hearing the elk bugle, and you hear all the things. That's what the hunt is all about, yeah. and the camaraderie and the places you're seeing. And you know that firsthand from our friends in South Dakota where we antelope hunt, mm -hmm. what great people they are and what the spectacular land they have. So when you harvest an animal, that's just icing on the cake. It's the yeah. bonus. It's not yeah. about just killing yeah. an animal. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of beautiful bobs. Yeah, if you notice now, these two birds here, the one that has the buff of the brown, that's the female. Yep. The one that has the white is the male. Okay. That's all of basically where you can tell the difference between the two. So when you're seeing them in the wild, the ones that have that brown are the females. Yeah, that's the female. Yeah, and the one with the white is the one that does it, buff, white whistle. It's kind of like that all through the animal kingdom, you know. Yeah. If it's a pheasant, you know, the male yeah. has got this spectacular sure. coloration, and the females, uh, the bob white quail, different. the elk or the deer, you know, they got the big horns and the majestic. Is that where blingy butt jeans came from for guys? <laughs> so guys wear those to attract the females? Is that what's going on? Could have been. I don't been. know what happened if Could've that's... Been. Is that the same case, Danny, uh, when it comes to humans, that the, the male are the more spectacular and the female? I don't think so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's the But there has here. to be something to set you apart from other, other men, though, right? Like, there has to be something. My husband's full of tattoos. That feels like peacocking a little bit, you know, <laughs> yeah. just a little bit. It's yeah. not true. I was just uh, maybe uh, adding some humor to our show. It's obvious that the uh, female species of the human race are the more spectacular in Thank appearance. You. Well, time I'm out. We, motion. we dress up for other women. I don't know that we're dressing up for men. I'm just saying. Oh, really? But, but I mean, if if we're ornate, you're welcome. Well, that you know? sounds like an <laughs> interesting topic. Yeah. We can bridge that another time. Oh, uh, let's we'll try to rope her back in here a little bit. <laughs> so, Thurman, uh, you, as I discovered in doing additional, you and I had the chance to meet a few years ago at the banquet. Sure. Um, and knowing you were going to be on the show, I wanted to do a little bit of research to to follow your career a little bit. And I have to say, I was incredibly impressed, quite floored actually, to see just how long you've been involved with the industry. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you could just speak a little to how you got started, what your, what sort of like spurned that start and interest in getting involved with quail. Yeah, when I was down south, we used to hunt quail. And so when I came to Minnesota, you know, I checked about the different birds we could hunt up here and all, you know, and asked about the bob white quail. I knew about the pheasant and the grouse and all. And he said, nah, it used to be a season, but they closed the season. What happened? You know, and they said, well, I, the numbers went down so low. I said, and I knew there was a rough grouse society. Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey, why don't we form a bop white quail society? Let's try to bring the bird back up. And that's, again, years and years ago. And so that was the way we started off is trying. I love to hunt the bird, of course, you know, so we're trying to bring those numbers back up. From there, we changed the name from bop white quail society to wings. Wings included more birds than just a bop white. And then when uh, Pheasants Forever came on, uh, they brought in Quail Forever. I said, hey, this is a good idea. Why don't we just get with that, that organization and let's really go, go out to Quail Forever and let's form a chapter. And the first one we formed, of course, was down in the southeast. It was just getting, trying to get some traction going in that part of the state for Quail. That's a uh, Pheasants Forever is a big name to have on board. Oh, it is. It is. And so they're the great ones that really brought on Quail Forever. It's kind of a different deal that. Like Quail Unlimited used to exist in this country, and they went kind of defunct here all at about oh, 15, 20 years ago. And Pheasants Forever knew there was a great following of quail hunters in this state. So mm -hmm. they said, hey, why don't we, we've done great work with uh, pheasants, with bringing them back and doing some work. Why don't we just get a uh, Quail Forever chapter going? Or they let it start around the country. And here we go. Them. Yep, yep. And it took off big time and all. So now you got Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever. So we get kind of a subsidiary. Oh, look at that guy. Yeah, we're kind of a subsidiary of, uh, you know, of Pheasants Forever. And so, uh, but yeah, both both organizations work well with youth and conservation and hunting and that type of thing. So we fit very well with them, and I enjoy them. Like I say, to give you the flex flexibility, however you want to run your chapters and all. And the unique great part about Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever like from the banquets, we generate the funds. We can do whatever we want to on the, with those funds in that local area. Okay. So we want to go scholarships. We want to buy guns, um, 
I was going to say, how do they support you as a as a bigger you know mothership? Basically, if they they just collect the membership, let's say a person joins, and that's basically all they want is just get the membership. Okay, they handle the rest, and they they take that membership from all the chapters around the country, and they really uh, uh, afford and allow people to go to Washington. They got representatives in Washington that really are strong on conservation, and so they got some strong advocacy there in Washington D.C. So the the chapters send the money to the membership only and we keep the donation the donations and the money we raise from the auctions and other things we get and we do what we want to and so that's a great thing so that is can, a great thing you know, it's just just wonderful because as uh, you know i've been involved with a lot of the nonprofits, the turkey federation mm-hmm. the elk foundation uh, bear the bear yeah i was mm-hmm. vice president of the north american bear foundation pheasants forever mm-hmm. and a lot of the organizations take a fair amount of that money and yeah. And it leaves kind of a sour taste in the, yeah. the bank with the committee members. And when they just take the membership, like Quill does, mm-hmm. and let you guys spend that money how you see fit, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be on the youth or uh, habitat, mm-hmm. what have we got here? The program serve 91.1% goes into program. All right. Mm-hmm. Less so, than 3% administration. That's nice. So that it's is really nice. great. You know, so the money is staying in the field, so to speak, and so it's so important because the habitat work that we need to do, and most people, the pheasant or quail, I think even a turkey and a deer and the rest of them know that the habitat, you have to have it in order to keep those species going. And so that's what we put the focus on is getting that habitat improved. And uh, and so it's just a passion of mine. So, hey, let's get out and do it. So I figure Habitat's I like the key. Do. Yep, yep. And Love if it them. helps the quail, it helps the pheasants, yep. and it helps... The deer, and yep. it helps the bunny rabbits, and sure. it hunts, helps the squirrel. Habitat's yeah. the key in everything. Yeah. You know, with the quail, quail, from a scientific point of view, they're looked at as an umbrella species, meaning that when you build habitat or improve habitat for bob white quail, you're impacting the meadow lark, impacting the sure. pollinators, pheasants, turkey, deer, all kinds of species, you know, many of the sparrows and all depend on that habitat. No other species is going to have that kind of impact on other species. Right, right. You can go deer and duck. All of them, they have their nice, you know, needs, but they don't have the reach as quail. So when you really invest in quail habitat, you're really doing a monumental job as far as helping other species. Yeah, that's an interesting tidbit there, uh, Thurman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, who, who, who do we, we got, got here? here? Oh, yeah. This Paul. Is, <laughs> yeah, this is a few years ago at our banquet there and all, you know, that uh, – no, that wasn't a banquet. That that was the um, uh, Pheasant Fest Quail Classic in Minneapolis here oh, about yeah. two, three years ago that we were at that and all, you know. And so uh, we always participate in that, especially yep. when it's here right here in the state and all, you know. And I so, was working with Outdoor News yeah. during when you had that picture taken. Sure, yep, yep. You didn't wow. poke your head in around the corner, hey, <laughs> hey, a little photo bomb. <laughs> no. Yeah. So you're you started off running the Southeast Minnesota chapter, yeah, building yeah. up habitat, that sure, kind of thing. Sure. So how do you go from there to move the into metro, the metro. metro? Well, we we got some really good support in the Southeast. You know, in fact, our last we had it here just before the COVID deal, we had our biggest uh, attendance ever. We had over 200 people showing up, which is a lot of support of quail down there. It's just people love wildlife. And so, but anyway, we thought, hey, you know, we're doing so well down there as far as getting people involved. Let's look at the metro area and look at, again, trying to get the youth outdoors, whether it's trap shooting or take them apple picking, snow, uh, snowboarding or whatever we're going to do. We take them to Cabela's, you know, where they can begin to look at some of these animals and things, you know. We do take the kids once a year down to southeast to see the quail habitat and hear about white quail down there and all. So we're trying to get the kids here in the metro area more involved with outdoors general outdoors yeah the southeastern oh, here we go. kids yep yep the southeastern kids that there. must is that a cup of coffee in your hand thurman that could have yep yep it yep. <laughs> must have been a morning yeah, there you go yeah we, we, that's the class that that's from uh caledonia high school there and, and all down there in great the, the southeast and everything you know yep get outside so, kids yeah, yeah we want them out there and all you know You're like these are these are trees and this yeah. is grass yeah, there you go. <laughs> i love that it says no child left indoors initiative that's yep. so great yep. you know thurman i would interject having work with a number of uh the nonprofits, uh the turkey federation has the jakes yep. you know kids uh sure um Boy, I just had them all on the tip of my tongue, and now I can't think of any of them other than the Jakes. Uh, 
the Elk Foundation has a, a program for the kids. For the youth, and, yeah. And the, the Deer Federation or the Deer uh, Minnesota Deer Association, they've got the spikes, and mm -hmm. they all have their own um, yeah. program for kids. For, for youth, yeah. And uh, from the looks of it, uh, you really are hammering it, and you're really doing a good job. Because I noticed that some of the uh, other – Nonprofits really don't. They just, Is that a twenty-two? Uh, yep. No, no, that's a, a four ten. Gauge. No, that's a four, four ten. ten. That's a four ten. Yeah. Anyway, it looks Those like guys. you're doing a great job yeah. on uh, trying to get the youth outside. Yeah. And I wish um, all the other nonprofits, whether it be the turkey, the elk, the deer. I wish they did a better job mm -hmm. of getting uh, the kids. Because when you go to those banquets, they always have a little program for the kids. But like even Oscar was going to be our next mm -hmm. guest. They have a, and he's involved with the uh, uh, Sheep Foundation. Mm -hmm. They uh, send kids. We'll talk about that when we see Oscar. But they send people down to Arizona, and it's all about habitat and getting kids out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're the future, right? Oh, you're exactly absolutely. right. You're exactly right. They're not only yeah. the future, they're the present. Yeah, you're exactly right. And when, we, uh, and when they're on the their rear ends in the on a sofa in the basement playing video games 10 hours a day, that's a real bad future. <laughs> yeah, that's is. a real Duck bad hunt future. Duck hunt isn't, uh, isn't yeah. like real hunting. No. No, yeah. there's no dog laughing at you. No. <laughs> no, if we could, uh, we, uh, hit a great milestone uh, in the hunting industry in general when women mm -hmm. got involved. It used to be a good old boy uh, sure. sport, and it was just all guys, the guys going to the cabin, guys going. To... Well, now the moms are mm -hmm. out there, and I don't care what organization, uh, whatever type of anti-hunting organization, they're not going to go against the moms that are teaching no. their kids how to get out in the field. and. Sure. So we get the we've got the women involved, which is well, a look at this thing. one. There's a there's a mom in the well. I would assume yeah, a mom in the sure. background taking yeah, pictures because yeah, she's yeah. proud. Yeah, she's one of our members. Well, this you know, metro uh, group what, here. What yeah. the mothers have learned yeah. is that if your kids out there in the fields and on the lakes, they're not going to be on the street corner. Yeah, you know, Ted Nugent talks about that all the time. It's like Uncle Ted. Oh, he's got such a, these kids and these. Us, we have such a passion for what we do. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to be in the casinos and uh, hanging out in, in, in maybe a strip joint or a bar. We, we just have such a passion for being in the outdoors. Sure. Wouldn't it be nice if everyone had a little taste of that? And I agree. They would get addicted to that, too. So I, I thought I'd it, interject that thought. Yeah, if we keep plugging away, I think it's it, it's going to take time, but I think we're going to get them. You know, it's just going to take time and all. You know, yeah. So. Take time and effort. Sure. People like you that are doing it. Oh, look at this young man. Yeah. So where's he? What school is he? I see the S, obviously, but what school Spring is that? Spring Valley, maybe? Yeah. No, no, this is the metro area here. I don't know what. Are we lost. Oh, yeah, no, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. He's one of the guys that was coming to our, our trap shoot, and he really loved a trap shoot. And I can't remember what school he went to, to be very honest with you. We got about 20 kids that's getting into the trap shooting quite a bit and all, and they love this stuff and all, you know. Yeah, I just wish I had more time to do it. No. <laughs> we can only be in so many places at yeah, once, Thurman. Yeah. And looking over, um, as I mentioned, reading about your celebrity with all the stuff I was seeing online, it just is amazing to me how many different things you have your hands in. I, I don't know how you sleep. It's not easy. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's not easy. I've cut down on some of the things I used to do, so I just don't you know, extend myself as much as I used to. Yeah, reading about the banquets and the the events, and I mean, we're ta right now we're spending a lot of time TK talking about all the stuff that he does, just being out in the field and being involved with the kids and the animals. Right, and we didn't even talk about the time commitment that is the behind the scenes mm -hmm. and running the organization and being coordinated on the state level and on the federal level and with the the mothership, as I put it, with pheasants forever and. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a time commitment that must be to have to do all that. It is. There's no doubt about it. It's, it does take time. It's know. like a full-time job. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Times two. It's a real commitment, and uh, God bless you for doing it. You know, we just had a picture of the kids out there at the trap shooting. That's been a big deal for us. I mean, you talk about getting kids in the outdoors. These kids, uh, like I'm going to visit some kids down in Caledonia, Iowa. I'm going to guide a couple of kids for turkey hunting next week. 
and they got they're on a trap shooting team in uh I'm sorry, Cresco, Iowa. Oh. I said Caledonia. But Cresco, Iowa, which is just south of the border from Caledonia and a little bit west. And that talk about getting kids into the outdoors. Thank you, Jill. That is a spectacular way, and the kids are loving it. Because, you know, you have trap shooting. Teaches the how safe trap shooting is. I don't know the statistics offhand, but I've heard how much safer trap shooting is than, say, football or baseball Mm -hmm. or any other sport, wrestling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Getting those kids involved with trap shooting maybe will lead to... Because of firearm safety on display? Absolutely. And you got adults like this picture right here. Now, these are church members that I attend. They go to the same church I go to. And uh, she has a 410 and everything. But you have adults there, supervisors. So they're always pointing out the gun. We're really getting the gun safety, so to speak, when we take these kids out, even just for trap shooting. Always respect that gun. And so it is a very safe sport. No, It is a safe sport. Mm -hmm. And I wish... Uh, Killer Kyle. Probably not getting too many today. broken arms, broken legs, broken ankles, no, concussions. No, certainly, you're not getting anybody shot because they all go through hunter and gun safety. Yep. And uh, it's just safe. Yeah. Point your gun up, keep it broke open like that little girl had it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a wonderful place to be. And I encourage anybody that's listening talk to your school. Talk to whoever you have to talk to. See if you can't get involved in a trap shooting league. Because sure. then you'll learn that guns are just a tool mm-hmm. like any other tool. Well, and I think that um, talking about how how when you restore like the quail habitat, you're also restoring everything around you. Mm-hmm. I think in the same way that nurturing you know, that establishment you know, or, or habitat, it's the same for a kid, right? So you, you bring in a kid and now you're nurturing that habitat, if you will. And then, you know, they're, you know, with other grownups and, and it could be their parents and it could be building something. So like, I think that this, this community and in, in your chapter that you're running here, I mean, you're, you're not only building better habitats for the wildlife, but you're building better habitats in the communities you touch. That's amazing. I couldn't have said it better. You're exactly right, Jim. <laughs> so she makes the big bucks there, Thurman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wonder how we look on camera when she's talking. She's right? the brains of the operation, <laughs> and she demonstrates it every week. Yeah, and exactly right. anyone that's watching goes, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> yeah. we're, we're Next time she does that time, I'm just going to move my mouth. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I will, too. <laughs> so people think it's yeah. me. Yeah, We'll trade off. <laughs> sure. We're so exactly smart. Right, you know. <laughs> but I think that's so important, though, too, because if you can establish those relationships, like I say, with people, kind of intergenerational type of things. you got the younger people with the older people, so to speak, the middle ages and all. It's so important, you know, to establish those. And now we have our side. And, again, it's not trying to kick out the way we do things, but everybody go their separate ways. The kids over here, the adults over there. But guys get together sometime and, and to be able to listen to some of these young people and all, what they're going through. And then to hear some of the old timers. And especially to get the kids around some of these guys that have been out hunting, like myself, and can tell some of these stories of things many times you missed, you thought you had oh, something. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's something for those kids to hear that stuff and all. And mm-hmm. they want to be a part of it. By the way, I did hear the shooting sports, which you're talking about there, uh, Tom. It's the fastest growing sport in America right now. Good. It's amazing, and it's just really, really taking off. And good, kids good, really, good. really love to do it and all. So we just want to see more kids doing it. Oh, absolutely. It's just so, such a benefit in so many areas. Yep, yep. I mean, our society, the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you a quick story. My wife and I were out in western, well, west of uh, Minnetonka, and a buddy of mine lives out there, and we went golfing. I think there will be a lot of people in the Twin Cities that don't realize that there is something west of Minnetonka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a little golf course out there, and I used to live in Aspen with this guy, and we're still great friends to this day. So we're out there golfing with him. Anyway, I don't want to make this story too long. We were leaving, and there was a young man on the side of the road who obviously ran out of gas. And Lynn and I stopped to see what we could do for him. And the poor young man had no idea. He had his phone in his hand. He had no idea how to communicate with Lynn and I. And I said, you're out of gas, am I correct? And he says, yeah. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, get get in my van. We're going to go down to this farmhouse. And we turned into the farmhouse, and I 
introduced ourselves to the farmer, and I said, this young man has run out of gas on the road down the way here. Uh, we're stopping by to see if you had a gas can and maybe could help us out. And he did. Well, this young man, and through the whole time, he you could tell he didn't know how to talk to him or Lynn and I. And so we got some gas. So when you him. say he didn't know how to, like he didn't speak English? I don't English? know how, how better to explain it is he didn't know. Yeah, he spoke English. Okay. But he didn't know how to communicate face to face. Oh. And I'll get to the reason I think that's the case. Okay. All right. So we fill this thing up with gas. And he kind of just stood there, and there was nothing wrong with the guy. Um, I looked at him, and he's got nothing. Uh, I said, listen, here's what you need to do. Take this gas can. My wife and I are going to go home. Go back down that driveway. Hand the gas can back to the man. Look at him in the eyes and put your hand out and say thank you. Mm -hmm. And I... You might have thought I was talking to a wall, <laughs> and I didn't follow him to see if he did it. But I think the reason he couldn't—he doesn't know who Mr. Miyagi is. Mr. Miyagi said, "You always look I." <laughs> yeah, the poor kid. I, I I would imagine he did that. Gave him back his gas can, and hopefully he said thank you. But the kid spent his whole life communicating on that phone, mm. yeah. and he's never. And I'm not the only one that thinks. I've heard psychologists talk about this. I don't know how it's going to impact the kids in the future. You know, like, you know, a great salesman, you know, he can talk to you all day long and tell you stories. This could, this kid couldn't even communicate. Wow. And it was, my wife and I just How sad at is that? It was very sad. And I said, geez, I, I don't know what to say about that poor kid in his future because he literally had no way of communicating with her and I or probably this farmer. Well, hopefully he took something from the experience with you. I hope as a, it did. A lesson to open his eyes a little bit. And I, I don't want you to think I was being mean to the kid, but I no, knew no. he needed to hear from an adult, hand him his gas can, put your hand out, shake his hand, look him in the eye, and say thank you. Mm -hmm. And just hearing that maybe uh, helped a little bit. I don't know. I don't know quite what to say about it. but Thurman, what do you when you're talking to your kids... How do you bridge that gap with them? Because obviously there's some interest when they're signing up to do some of these events with you. Mm -hmm. But how do you get that into their brains, you know? So far we've been fortunate. The people, the young people, and we bring their parents along with us too. You know, they've been very respectful, cordial. We had a couple that kind of get off, and you, like you say, like this young man here, that's kind of in their own world and everything, you know. And yet I understand it. It's, you know, the home bringing up, you know, a lot of times they haven't had the proper training, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to acknowledge other people, to respect other people, to say the thank you, these small things, you know. And if a child is brought up in that kind of environment, you know, and next thing, you know, go to your room and play a game, that's all he does and everything, you know. So it's, it's I can't blame the child. I'm seeing this is what we've produced. Yep. And we need to be looking at, guys, we got to, do something here to try to change this. And again, trying to get them together, whether we're going to take them out hunting, fishing, hiking, or whatever, canoeing, whatever. It's just trying to get the group together. And when we take them out, we, well, first of all, we start, we are a church group pretty much. we kind of Christian base. And so we have the kids read scripture and we have somebody to do a prayer. So they get, we break it down, they get into little groups and we have them where they have to kind of communicate with one another. And after the, the whole thing is over, whether we're trap shooting or going, uh, let's say Cabela's or whatever. We always treat everybody to a pizza. So just being around the food. Oh, that's cool. Nice things, you know. Break Everything some bread you, together, yep, right? Yep, yep. And no charge to none of the kids or their family members. You just come and hey, we're gonna take care of the thing. But anyway, you, you do find, you guys say a prayer? Yes, we do. Oh, yes, that's important do. because uh, again, we Christian based, so to speak. Yeah. But the kids relax and they, they love it and everything. You know, they just look forward to going to it. And none of them say, hey, man, I want to go home or whatever. And they, lo they just love doing it. No, you know. What I find is the kids don't really mind doing it. The challenge is, I think, we don't have enough adults interested enough to, to sacrifice to say, hey, i got to deal with more of the kids than just my own. Yeah. And I know that, you know, we got to deal with our own kids and everything. But we're living in a time now, I think, where we have to look at it. I am my brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. i got to go beyond my family. i got to try to get some other kids involved because... 
it's just too many single parents out there, and, and not to put any blame on them, and they, they have their problems and all, but we have to somehow or another take up the slack because the training is not happening in the homes. And that's when we see in this situation in this country now is so much tension and violence and all this stuff. It's the homes are just kind of broken down, so to speak. Well, you hit the, excuse me, Shane, you hit the nail right on the head. I, when I first heard you say they come there with their parents, mm-hmm. you know, that's the, that's a big deal. That's yep. a key yep. part of the equation. Yep. You know, if we can get the parents involved and they keep along mm-hmm. with their kids, well, then I think you're going to get a better yep. result. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say there's there's quite a few youth based programs, and you think about scouts, and you think about mm-hmm. boys and girls clubs, and the YMCA, and all these other kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But I think they're all of them are missing one important element, and that's the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. You know, having that the scouts used to do a lot outdoors, and now they're just doing a, it seems like less and less of that. Yeah. We pulled our um, he's now twelve, but when he was eight, we had him in scouts for a couple of years mm-hmm. um, when he was six, seven, eight. Ended up pulling him out because it was like 99% of what we were doing was if sort of formal, informal, just meeting in a lunchroom at the church and mm-hmm. them talking about scout code and, you know, upcoming regatta and, you know, th- those kinds of things. Mer- little miscellaneous things in their books to potentially earn badges or things of belt loops. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, we want to get these kids outside. I remember when I was mm-hmm. young as a scout growing up, we were on trips all the time, right. canoeing and camping oh, yeah. and learning about sure tying knots and sure. tents and wilderness survival sure. and Definitely. and Definitely. habitat and animals and like all this stuff. And so sure. I was like, after two and a half years of this with Michael, um, talking about Tom, obviously we were just like, okay, we're, we're out, you know, yeah. this didn't make sense to keep doing it. Right. Right. You know, the thing is, if you look at nature to me, I think nature's a great draw for all of us. You know, it has the birds, the trees, the flowers, uh, you know, the wind, the weather, all so many facets of nature can pull us together all that god gave done, us yeah and what we've done is kind of turn our back on nature and gone to the electronics to the high-tech stuff which is okay we got to have that stuff but i'm just saying that is the one magnet that can pull us all together you get people out and like take the kids fishing i mean they love that stuff you take them out trap shooting you know take them hunting they love that but again I, what we have done i think as a society we don't have enough adults really taking the time the kids love doing it you know, I have never ran across, I don't want to go, you know, <laughs> right. they love doing it, but it's just, we don't have the adults stepping up. So, Hey, I'm willing to take on five or six or three or let's join a, a group. That's, well, now I can help out. We can bring more kids or whatever. Mentorship. Yep. Yeah. That is the key to, but uh, nature itself has so much to offer. We can look at the, the hunting just itself is just tremendous to get kids out there. You know, yeah. that's how I got started with the hunting part. You bet. You know, so it just means so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I tell you what, here's what we're going to do. We are going to take a little break because we got to pay the bills. So we get our uh, sponsor promotion in here. And then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the organization. We're going to talk about some upcoming events. And we're going to talk a little bit about how folks can get involved if they want to donate their time and or financial resources to help promote the program and, and, and this development with kids that we've been talking about. Sure. So we'll be back with Thurman Tucker after the break. Thurman Tucker, not Thurman Thomas. Not Thurman Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, if that's the only problem you have. Boots and Backstraps is proudly brought to you by Homes by Shane. Making your move with the Homes by Shane team means an unparalleled customer service experience. That level of service is the foundation of this REMAX Results referral-based business. Our driven team of experts communicate with their clients every step of the way, ensuring a memorable experience from the first conversation through your closing day. Go to homesbyshane.com for more information. Let's get you home. If you would like to sponsor the Boots and Backstraps podcast or you have an interest in joining our team, send us an email to bootsandbackstrapspodcast at gmail.com. Welcome back to Boots and Backstraps. Before we left for our break... We were talking a lot about youth and getting youth outdoors and the youth programs. And what I want to do is maybe diverge that a little bit tighter into quail sure. forever. And uh, if you could talk about how a person goes about getting involved with your organization, not just the youth, um, but maybe adults that want to donate their sure. time. Sure. Yeah, before it was strictly banquets. And since COVID-19, last year and this year, it's kind of thrown a monkey wrench into our operating as far as 
uh, getting banquets off the ground. So this year and last year we are not have we didn't have one a banquet last year, nor are we having one this year. Right. But we do have if a person would like to donate, yeah. uh, we do have uh, we're on Facebook. It's Quail Forever Minnesota. If you want to ever go to Quail Forever Minnesota, and actually week before last, the last two weeks, we ran some information on how a person could donate money if they, if they wanted to okay. to help the quail, uh, either the Metro or the Southeast uh, group. It doesn't matter. And so if you want to go to uh, Quail Forever Minnesota. Here we go. Yep. There's there a Facebook go. page. Yep, yep. Uh, there you go. Yep, it's on Facebook. And I do a Facebook every Thursday updating on what's happening with quail. And hey, there you are. Here's yeah, a little what video. Do you know? <laughs> what do you know? Yeah, that's the one that focuses on quail habitat benefits and many other forms of wildlife. So you read that article there and all, and it lets you know. It gives you the address and everything how you can uh, help the birds and all. So uh, Not just the quail, all the songbirds. There you go. There you the go. The pheasant, the turkeys. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Game what, birds and the go, songbirds. Danny, can you go back to that for a quick second? That's not a quail on top. That's no, a pheasant, no, no, right? no. Yeah. So we 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 cover all the species. You know, all okay. the bird species. You know, so uh, game birds. That's the southeastern deal. There we have just you know, just some of the habitat there. Excellent quail habitat there. Oh, look at those beautiful uh, colors. Yeah, the colors of the trees and all. So we've done quite a bit of things there. Wonderful deer. So we into all wildlife. That so is a pig right yeah. there. <laughs> beautiful animal there, right? You know, just the colors. Look at and that. All. Yeah. And so we're really into nature, getting people to look at nature again has so much to offer if we can just take our time to get into nature more than we're doing right now. Can you, Danny, go back to that road shot again? Kind of zipped through it there. Uh, right that one, that there. one. Yeah. Where is that picture? This really came off the Internet here and all. Okay. And what I do in every season, I show some colors of the different or the vegetation oh, there's, so and that's a male right that's the male bob white quail there and all you know uh beautiful bird and all you know are there um other species other than bob white there are oh yeah about five other different species of quail you got the valley quail the scale quail the california quail so you got quite a few of them. but the bob white the eastern bob white is the one that's in this part of the country here the other birds out west pretty much and all you know gamble okay. quail yeah, yeah, those gammels and all you know so. is it uh slow down danny there's a cardinal there. Yep, yep. I had a cardinal in our yep. front yard the other day. I was sure. so impressed with that. Sure, sure. See, they benefit from quail habitat, too. All so, the birds do. Yep, yeah, they do. You and bet so they do. Many, so when you're really helping <clears throat> quail, you're really helping an awful lot of the wildlife. Especially yeah, it's fantastic. And, and I know a lot of our listeners are bird people, and whether they hunt them or just watch them. And, mm-hmm. yeah. If we can, uh, well, this is a whole nother topic. If we can back off on the, on the feral cats, yeah. and they do such a damage to the quail, to all the songbirds, sure. all the game birds. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole nother topic, and then I guess we don't want to dive into that right now, but I would encourage people to neuter their cats. Yep. Yeah. Keep them on a leash. Keep them at home. Yeah. Don't let them run wild. Yeah. Wasn't it Bob Barker used to say that? Have your pet spayed or neutered? <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> yeah, that at the end of every show. Yeah. Bob Barker. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you've got a, an event coming up, right? This Quail Field Day you were telling me about. Yes, we do have one coming up in Spring Grove, Minnesota. Now, when I first started with quail, in fact, it started in 70, I think it was 70, 69, so to speak. We just kind of toying with the idea of trying to get the quail organization going. Anyway, You weren't at me, Woodstock in 69? I know, I know. No, I didn't. <laughs> they can do what they did without me. But anyway, <laughs> long story short, though, is what happened is that I was went to the DNR to find out where quail are in the state, and they were in the southern half of the state. So anyway, I just spent a lot of time, central part and all, you know, so I, I was all over the place, so to speak. And I finally talked to some people, so you should go to southeastern Minnesota. So I got to southeastern Minnesota in 69 to probably about 76 Okay. And I finally got to southeastern uh, Houston County. And, man, I, I was talking to people. I couldn't believe it. I get to, let's say, Wabasha County. As people are just seeing quail, uh, used to be, went on a county. Yeah, we hear them here and there and all. Olmstead County, and I'm still in the southeast. Yeah, every now and then. Fillmore County, yeah, we, we hear them. It's, got to Houston County. Oh, yeah, we see them all the time. Give an idea of what this was like. Okay, 
I, these other counties, I, I would go to high schools and everything and, and, and have a whistling deal of the quail and, and show them a picture of what the quail look like. You've got a, a sound device with yep, you. Yep, yep. Yeah, so when you're, when you're finished with your story, I sure. want to hear this. Okay, so anyway, they knew what I was talking about in there. Yeah. And so let's say the average high school class I was attending, let's say in Winona, uh, Olmstead County, Wabashaw County, those counties, you got 20, 30 kids in there. And here and there you see one or two raise their hand. I got to Houston County, Spring Grove. It says 30 kids, all of them raised their hand. <laughs> you got to be kidding. Oh, yeah, we hear them all the time. It's, man, so there was just a hot spot. Go to Caledonia High School, which is right in uh, Houston County. Oh, yeah, Houston High School, same thing. I mean, they were there. You and, pheasant hunt in Caledonia, right? Yeah, turkey hunt. Turkey, hunt turkey. Down okay. There and all. But the numbers have really mm. dropped off since back then and everything, you know. Yeah. I mean, they would just, oh, you hear them all the time, you know. You know, I saw them and everything and everything else. Was, uh, and my first view, uh, my first impression was maybe these were least birds. But there were so many all over the county. So I said, no, this is not right. Because I went to Winona County, Wabashaw County, Goodhue County. And you don't hear nothing. But you're getting out, oh, yeah. You talk to the old time, oh, yeah, I see them all the time, you know. Never will forget in Spring Grove High School. Went there and was talking to him. And one of the, one of the kids raised his hand. And said, "Yeah, we see him when we out snowmobiling." And so oh, yeah. So I wanted to go to the location. So he took me there and everything. And sure enough, there were quail down there. And all son of a gun. So we put up feeders and all. But the point is, is that there were a lot of quail back then, not like it was, let's say, probably eighty, ninety years ago. But it was much more than the, the other counties. And still Back in the now, late 70s? Yep, yep. Late 70s, all the way up to about 95, and all of a sudden the, number cra- the numbers crash. But not only in Houston County, around the country. The what numbers do you suppose crashed. that was for, or what happened? What I haven't talked to a number of people about it, but it, most people believe it's a combination of habitat loss and the chemicals. Sure. And... Uh, there's a chemical that's been on the scene here now for since they kicked it out about, uh, oh, I think, about 93, 95. And sure enough, bam, those numbers went down tremendously. Again, you got greater yields now, but the birds. And it shows here, too, that not just quail, but uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithologists. And these are people that are pros as far as tracking birds. And Cornell is no joke. Yep, they are New York. And they looked at North America, North America from 1970 to right now, a little over 50 years, we've lost almost 3 billion birds. Wow. You're looking at, I, I, you know, you go out for people who watch, I don't see the blackbirds that used to fall time, you see these big waves, I don't see that anymore. I remember you know? those, and they're rare yeah, to see Yeah, anymore. you don't see them. And they began to list all the different birds. So, yeah, that's right, I don't see those birds now. And I remember, too, just driving my car, we've drive down to Memphis and everything, that's where I'm from. We would take the kids down about every other year. And I would say between here, and I would drive down, I'd say between here and La Crosse, I'd have to wipe the bugs off the windshield. <laughs> I can go to St. Louis and don't have to wipe the bugs off the windshield. I mean, it's just no Because the bird population's so the high. Bugs, yeah. I'm just saying the bugs have been taken off the scene, what the birds eat. The chemicals have knocked them down so much. So I think it's a combination of chemicals and loss of habitat has hurt the birds so much. But a meadowlark, you see meadowlarks all the time. It's rare to see a meadowlark now. Right. Well, you so, mentioned sighting, and I know you've got a way to yeah yeah to hear them. I would love for you to, to play some of those sounds here in your microphone there. Yeah. So people and you can just describe what these sounds are. This well, I will like to hear the sound first, but I think this is going to be the uh, the cubby call here. Well, we just see what it's going to be like here, because a lot of times I cannot imitate the whistle. I have to bring this thing along. With yeah, me. hold it up here, Thurman, by your mic. There you go. Okay. Okay. We're going to try this guy here. That's a covey call. So what is the covey call doing? Okay. I think one more time. Calling other birds to join their covey. <laughs> what it is is that <laughs> quail like to stay together in a group, a flock, but we call them coveys. Okay. It could be three birds or 30. So the covey could be, average covey is probably about 10 to 15 birds. Okay. So when you bust that covey, you're out hunting or something like that, or let's say a fox flush them, they're going to fly in different directions. So what they're doing, they're calling each other back, knowing where, where they're different. Regrouping. Yeah, regrouping, basically. Okay. So that's a covey call. You hear that call primarily during the fall and winter time. Okay. And, you, you know, so you can hear that a lot. A lot of times, I, and I've played it to kids, oh, yeah, I've heard that sound, but I didn't know what that was. And all. So that was a Bob <laughs> White. But the real sound that they, and it is the mating call in the springtime, it starts now until about 
August, you're going to hear this sound here. And this is the one that everybody is so familiar with about Quay Call. It's the, uh, this call here. Um, Oh, yeah. Sounds like the bird is saying Bob White. Yeah. That's where they get the name from, Bob White Quail. And so people love that sound. I want to hear those birds and all, you know. So, all right. But, you got to play it one more time. I got to listen for Bob White. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we try it here. Oh, yeah. Did you hear the Bob White in there? I heard it. I had a go. Yeah. Clear as day. I cannot imitate that, so I should bring this along to help out. No. Do you know that call, Tom? Uh, I've never tried it, no. I was going to say, that might be the one call I haven't heard you do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you another idea on Bob White Quail now. Yeah. Missouri did, an, a sorry, show, shows you how popular this bird is. Missouri put a survey out here about six years ago around the whole state. They asked people which bird would they prefer to have on their property. They had cardinals on there, pheasants on there, blue jays on there. All of them. Bob White quail was the number one bird. Everybody wants the Bob White. Everyone uh, loves the Bob White. Oh, yeah. So you get, oh, yeah, we want that bird around. And then you see the antics, the way they kind of go around. And it's just very, very a very entertaining species. And not that the other ones are not. But that's just a very special bird and all. Yeah. So what's the uh, quail field day then? The quail field day is going to be held in Spring Grove, Minnesota. And I think I'm saying that that's when it, it used to be the hot spot for quail in Minnesota for me. And But anyway, we're going to have it there this year. We generally have a quail field day. And what it is, a group of people come together, basically quail enthusiasts. And we hand out information. We show them uh, updated materials on what they can do to improve quail habitat on their properties. This year we're going to be a little different. And we're focusing so much on youth. We want to get it there in Spring Grove and have the kids from Spring Grove FFA chapter come over and be a part of this field day. So we're going to bring the whole class over so they can be a part of that and all. Before, it's been pretty much the adults, old-timers like myself and all. But now we want to bring the kids involved. So we have it on May 28th, and it's going to be at the uh, – uh, in fact, I'll put it on. I'm going to be this coming um, – uh, Thursday, I'll put it on their Facebook. They okay. should give the address of so a person who wanted to come down and they can be a part of it. So they should go to the Facebook page to get updates yep. about yep. that and, of course, other things that are going on with yep. the um, organization. Yep. And yep. if they want to donate their time or if they want to donate yep. some sure. resources to help with the youth program sure. um, or other things that are happening with Quail Forever, then sure. they can do that, I would assume, on the website or the Facebook yep. page as yep. well. Yep, yep. Either one, you know. Facebook is every week we're going to update on stuff, what's going on with quail and all. And so. Saw the uh, video there, a little cameo from you talking. Now, do you film that with your phone or somebody film it for you? <laughs> well, would you believe my, my wife, the professional, no, she just did it. <laughs> you know, we thought we'd do something a little different. That was back last fall and all. We thought we'd get out and uh, some property we have in Invergrove Heights. Uh, Vance Grant, is, he's, he, now he loved kids like I am. Unfortunately, Vance passed away back in the fall. But on his property, that's what we did, that uh, that little uh, shot there with the video and all. Okay. But he really loved kids, though. You know, we, uh, speaking of your wife, Thurman, what a wonderful woman. We have to give a little shout-out yeah. to her. And at all of the banquets, she brings her State Fair award-winning carrot cake. And uh, that's always one of the big prizes. She's just a delightful gal, so give her all of our love. Yep, shall do. She'll do. I think I remember distinctly at that banquet that I was at that it was a silent auction item, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And it was quite a hot ticket, and I didn't understand until you told me that it was an <laughs> award-winning. I was like, well, his wife must be a really good cook. And then you said, no, this is award-winning carrot cake. It's so good. Yeah. I'm just drooling thinking about it. <laughs> well, let me mention how that got started. You know, yeah. the uh, Conservation Reserve Program, the federal program, they came out with a program where they wanted to help quail. And there was only two counties in the state of Minnesota that was going to be a part of this federal deal. And it was called a CP33 initiative. And that started back in 2006. And so in order for us to get people, to, landowners, to enroll into that, yeah. we wanted as many because it was strictly uh, designed to help quail. So we wanted to get landowners to enroll. And so for everyone who would enroll in that program, they were going to get a carrot cake. And so we gave them a free carrot cake. My wife baked those cakes. And the word got, oh, those carrot cakes are so good. So anyway, we thought we'd bring a big one to the banquet down there. 
and we'd auction it off there. And one of the, the top prize we got was one of us nice size sheet cake. It was four hundred some dollars we got. For yeah. One Whoa. Uh, they love that carrot cake. Now here in the metro area, they just didn't eat know. your heart out, buddy yeah. Velasco. <laughs> so, they didn't know too much about it and all. But down there, man, they go for that carrot cake and all, you know. But it was just thing we thought was sweet enough to deal with the federal program trying to get this. Uh, Sweeten up the deal. <laughs> I see. I see. He meant it, it literally. Yeah, there you go. But anyway, that's how the carrot cake got started. And all. That's a great right. story. Yeah. Uh, and again, your wife is a delightful person. I Appreciate vote that, it, um, you. you know, when you come back next year, you bring your wife and carrot cake. That would yeah. be wonderful. Hey. And <laughs> carrot cake. cake. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Giddy up on that. <laughs> well, I tell you what, gentlemen, we got to bring this thing in for a landing. Sure. So it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here, Thurman. My pleasure, too. It's yeah. been just great, Thurman. Yeah. You're such a good friend, and I yeah. look forward to the time when we can uh, do the banquets again, and maybe Shane and I can jump in there and give you a hand and recruit some would more people. would love to help. Yeah. Of course, and, we'd love to uh, help. Boy, uh, folks, I encourage you to go to Thurman's uh, Facebook page and check it out. Well, Forever Minnesota. Well, mm-hmm. Forever Minnesota. Donate some money. Get involved. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization. Uh, uh, I really enjoy working with you, Thurman, and thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, folks, I'd like to close the show with uh, a thought. Whether you're belting out your favorite country song or pursuing your favorite game animal, I encourage you to use that same enthusiasm to pursue the Lord. He will teach you to shoot straight. We'll see you next week. Come on now. On his own, looking for bag straps, way deep in the woods, tracking in a swamp to a hay field under the harvest moon. When the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. Head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and backstraps.